Hi, I'm Luis Ortega for BCR Online, and we today have the pleasure of interview Professor uh, Renato Lopez, who is a uh, well-known trialist uh, working in Duke University in North Carolina, USA. Professor Lopez, we are here to discuss a very timeable trial, very important trial for the ESC meeting, virtual meeting, and it's the Brace Corona trial. Please, uh, can you introduce to us the background, methodology, results, and your conclusion of this trial? Sure, thanks Luis for having me here. So as everybody remember, in the beginning of the pandemic, there has been some concerns about the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs interfering with the virus and potentially leading to worse outcomes because of the increasing expression of ACE2, which is something that is increased um, in some studies in patients using ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and that's how the virus get entering in the cell. So this could potentially lead to worse outcomes. But then on the other hand, we also have seen papers showing that, no, if you use ACE inhibitors and ARBs, you're gonna have, actually have the anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrosis protection, and therefore protect the lung against coronavirus. So really, uh, conflicting evidence in terms of this rationale uh, of potentially getting the infection worse or actually protection, protecting against the infection if you use ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And all of the studies so far has been observational in nature. And we know that through observational studies, it's very difficult to assess the real treatment effect because of the unmeasured confounders that all these analyses have. So having that said, having said that, in, based on this background, and what we believe there was an equipoise to be tested prospectively, we undertook the BRACE Corona trial, which basically was a randomized multi center phase four study where patients needed to present to the hospital with a positive COVID 19. So we really want to make sure that patients were COVID positive, taking AC libres or ARBs for hypertension or for heart failure. And then we randomize patients to either stop their medications for 30 days or continue their medication as normally they would. And uh, after doing that, the primary endpoint that we chose was the number, day, the number of days alive and out of hospital for 30 days, which was the follow-up uh, of the trial. Of course, we also measure endpoints in the hospital so in hospital endpoints like myocardial infarction, troponin elevations, myocardial injury, uh, TIA, strokes, thromboembolism. So we also measure those events, but the primary endpoint was the days, the number of days alive and out of the hospital. And we took the, we undertook the, the trial um, in Brazil. So there were 29 hospitals in Brazil. And this was a collaboration between the DOR Institute for Research and Education, EDOR, and also the Brazilian Clinical Research Institute, the BCRI, were the coordinating centers. And we randomized 659 patients in um, a little bit over two months and in 29 hospitals in Brazil. So basically that was the design uh, of the trial. The primary results, therefore, was that we did not find any significant difference in the number of days alive and out of the hospital between the two strategies. And why did we choose this endpoint? So this endpoint was something that uh, we've been using more and more in cardiology because it is something that is very patient-centered. The patients care about being well, alive, and out of the hospital. And because we wanted to do a pragmatic trial, remember this was a registry-based randomized trial. So we use an ongoing registry to randomize from that registry. So really pragmatic. And when we want to do something pragmatic, choosing the right endpoint that is hard enough, that is patient-centered, but it can also be easily assessed uh, is very important. And that's why we chose the number of days alive and out of the hospital. And basically, there was no significant difference um, in terms of the number of days alive and out of the hospital between the two strategies uh, that uh, patients were randomized to. So basically that, that was the main 
result of the trial. And in terms of clinical implication, I think um, our trial is innovative in, in a few ways, um, especially because of this registry-based aspect uh, that is the first time was done in Brazil. But I think the three major clinical implications that we can mention is that first, the brace corona really provides randomized trial evidence showing that stopping the ACE inhibitors and ARBs for 30 days did not impact the number of days alive and out of the hospital in patients with COVID-19. I think that's the first important thing. Second is because our data really indicate that there is no clinical benefit in routinely stopping these medications in hospitalized patients uh, with mild to moderate COVID-19, that means that these medications should be generally continued um, when once patient has an indication. So in other words, whether we should stop or not these agents should be based on the clinical indication and not based on the presence of COVID-19. And I think that's the answer that we are uh, really seeking for in clinical practice. And because, again, the nature of our trial, I think our findings const constitute contemporary and high quality randomized evidence to guide the care of patients uh, with COVID-19. So basically those are the three clinical implications that I think I believe that might help physicians now with this question, with this uncertainty that we had before uh, with more reliable data and guiding them on how to manage these patients in clinical practice. Great results, great results. We are waiting from them. I have a few questions, Professor. Uh, one of them is, uh, if, if, you, if we have to translate this to clinical practice, okay, we have, in COVID-19, we have 80% of the patients with our asymptomatics or our mild symptomatics. We have uh, like a 14 of the patients who de develop a moderate to moderate uh, disease, and we have a 5% of the patients who develop really severe complications. So uh, how can you apply in these three different group of patients the results of the BRACE corona trial? I think BRACE really studied patients who got hospitalized and were mild to moderate. So uh, if a patient, which is really basically the patients that we really uh, care about, because if you have COVID and you don't have symptoms or you are really minimally symptomatic and you were staying home, I think there was no question if you should stop or not really uh, your medications, your baseline medications. So uh, the, co the concerns were more into when you go to the hospital, what should we do? And I think um, Grace Corona really gave this answer uh, in a more reliable way to a randomized evidence. Um, for the severe cases, we really did not include those in the, in the trial because those patients usually come in shock and they usually are needing uh, vaso vasoactive drugs. And therefore, normally we need to stop any antihypertensive drug because the patient actually is in shock. So we didn't believe that those were patients that we had a lot of doubts because we need to stop this drug. So the echo poise was really into the mild and moderate patients, which we didn't know what to do. And I think now we know that we should continue these drugs and only stop them if there is a clinical indication to stop regardless of COVID diagnosis. So in other words, COVID should not influence our decision in stopping or not stopping this medication. I, I, I know that the, you, your group, I have to congratulate yourself and all your team in, in Brazil for leading this in very important trial. I know that you are, are very, very, did it very, very fast. I, I want to ask if it is possible to know some of the secondary endpoints, such as the endocardial injury or the rate of MI and, and this type of cardiovascular events. I also read in, in, in clinicaltrial.gov that you were seeking also some biomarkers. If maybe you can share some of these results, if it's possible, if you have analyzed them. Yeah, in general, uh, these were these were data that is coming up in the publication with more details, but I can tell you that in general, in all secondary endpoints that we look, which was interesting because we have the cardiovascular endpoints, which include myocardial infarction, myocardial injury, um, worsening heart failure, hypertensive, hypertensive crisis, stroke, TIAs, and venous thromboembolism. Uh, we have all these events, but we also have events such as uh, disease progression. So if there was any impact in continuing or discontinuing these ACE inhibitors and ARBs in terms of disease progression. 
So this was another endpoint that we assessed in the trial with uh, clinical factors and also with imaging through CT. To, so this was really uh, to chest CT. And what I can tell you is that in general, there was no significant difference in any of the secondary endpoints between the three strategies. If anything, numerically in general, uh, numerically, not statistically significant, but numerically favoring um, continuing the ACE inhibitors and ARBs. But again, the main message is that no significant difference uh, for the secondary endpoints, which is really reassuring because when you choose an endpoint that is the number of days alive and out of the hospital, basically this is capturing uh, whatever happened in the hospital. And uh, if you had more MIs and more strokes uh, or more uh, worse disease progression in one group, these will have been translated in more days in the hospital and therefore captured in the primary endpoint. And since we didn't see any difference in the primary endpoint, would make sense to not see a uh, significant difference as well in the secondary endpoints, which is exactly what we did. So in the way I see, all, all the endpoints go in the, in the same direction, no? that there is no issue of continuing the medication. So doctor, I, I have only one more question. Uh, I know that your group and yourself are very well investigators and know in the, in the area, the topic of anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy. So if you can give us a preliminary of what you are doing, if you are doing another trial of COVID-19 in this topic, in specific anticoagulants or antiplatelets? Yeah, that's a great question because I think that after the corticosteroids, which we know now has a really impact in mortality for COVID patients with COVID-19, particularly with, uh, with, when, they, when patients need oxygen therapy, I believe that the potential second blockbuster uh, treatment might be anticoagulation therapy because we learned through several studies and several reports that um, the COVID-19 really is a pro-thrombotic disease. Patients are having a lot of thrombotic events, both in the venous, but also on the arterial side. And uh, patients are dying from pulmonary embolies and uh, arterial thrombosis. And when they don't die, they get complicated and got long time in the hospital. So it is something really important. The question that we don't know is how to treat these patients. Uh, once they don't have an indication for full dose anticoagulation, should we increase the dose of anticoagulation therapy for these patients? Does the COVID-19 alone should be an indication for a, for a full dose anticoagulation therapy? So that's the question that nobody knows. There are some observational studies trying to show this association, but again, they are not randomized and it's always very dangerous to assess treatment effects. Uh, without randomization. So we are doing a trial in Brazil, it's called the ACTION study. And the ACTION study randomizing patients with COVID-19, elevated D-dimer, to a strategy of full dose anticoagulation with rivaroxaban, 20 milligrams once daily, versus anti prophylactic anticoagulation therapy, whatever is the standard of care in each hospital. For those patients with rivaroxaban, if they get unstable and get intubated, we switch to low molecular weight heparin, but also in the full dose regimen. And then when they get stable again, we transition back to rivaroxaban, and then we keep rivaroxaban for up to 30 days after randomization, because we also believe that even when patients go home, for at least 30 days, they might still be under risk of a thrombotic event. So that's the action study. We are planning to randomize 600 patients. We already have 150 patients randomized. Uh, we are looking at death, mortality, length of stay, and also length of oxygen therapy need uh, as the hierarchical primary endpoint. Uh, it's called a win-win ratio is the type of analysis that we are uh, performing in this trial. So we are randomizing from 40 centers in, the, in Brazil and we hope to have the results by the end of the year. A result that I really think is really important because we need to assess the potential of full anticoagulating these patients, but in the light of the risk of bleeding, which most of the reports don't um, describe in details or systematically the bleeding risks. So every time we talk about anticoagulation therapy, it's important to have the trade-off. So this is the trial we're doing in hospital. We're also doing a trial 
very similar to the Mariner, Mariner trial, which is extended patients who got hospitalized. And then by the time of discharge, they got put on rivaroxaban 10 milligrams for 45 days to see if this extended prophylactic for medically ill patients can be protected. So that's called the Michel trial that we are also doing in Brazil. And um, we plan to randomize about 400 patients. And then we are also doing another trial on the pre-hospital arena, which is called the CARE study. And the CARE study is getting patients who do not need to go to the hospital, but have COVID positive or suspected with additional risk factors for VTE, and they are put on rivaroxaban 10 milligrams for 14 days versus placebo or versus standard of care. So if you think about, I think we are really fortunate to be doing the, probably the most comprehensive anticoagulation program around COVID-19 in the world because we have the pre-hospital uh, setting with the care study, we have the in-hospital uh, setting with the action study, and we have the post-discharge study um, with the Michel uh, trial. And we hope to have uh, results for these three trials, hopefully by the end of the year, which I think is going to be really informative for the treatment of COVID-19 uh, all over the world. Fantastic, Dr. Lopez. Uh, we have an uh, extremely interesting interview. We have take a look on the, the preliminary results of the corona, base corona trial. So very important topic. There was a, a, an announcement and a release of the ESC at the beginning of the pandemic. I have to say that here in, in Spain, we, we try to stop the medications because of the concerns of the, of, of the issues. And then uh, Professor Lopez also have uh, show us his future trials regarding antithrombotic therapy in COVID-19, which is, uh, as he said, I, I mock him, uh, the blockbuster, and will be also probably one of the most important therapeutics besides the corticosteroids or besides the, the vaccine when, when it's available. And very, I, I'm, I'm very happy to have this uh, interview for PCR online. We have the pleasure to have one of the best, best trialists now, and he show it in the interview. So many thanks, Dr. Lopez, for your time. Uh, and from PCR online, thank you. Thank you very much, Luis, for having me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Thank you.